Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the IOSH webinar on practical ideas to make your business COVID secure. The webinar is being run by the Food and Drink Industries Group. My name is Pamela Brown and I am Head of Health and Safety at Allied Bakeries and Vice Chair of the Food and Drink Industries Group Committee. Today I have with me David Chaplin, Group Safety, Health, Environment and Sustainability Manager at Corn Foods and Alison Wright, Head of Health, Safety, Environment in the Males Division at Samworth Brothers, who both also sit on the Food and Drink Industries Group Committee. I know that many of you will still be working from home and will have attended numerous webinars on this subject over the last couple of months. However, today we are hoping to share some practical ideas from across the food and drink industry of measures companies have put in place to stop the transmission of COVID-19 in their workplaces. These ideas have been taken from, num from a number of different food companies, so thank you all who have allowed us to use your examples. And for those of you who have joined today, you see if you can spot examples from your sites. So what are we going to cover today? As way of introduction, I am going to have a quick look back to where this all started and very briefly touch on where we stand from a legal perspective. Then I'm going to hand over to David. David is going to share some examples of controls towards the top of the hierarchy, particularly focusing on visitors and contractors coming onto your sites. He is then going to look at controlling how people move around your site, including some of the challenges of social distancing in common areas. Then David will hand over to Alison. Alison will share some examples of social distancing in manufacturing and logistics operations and in offices. Alison will also talk about cleaning and hygiene requirements. She will then hand back to me and I will cover some more of the administrative controls, including dealing with emergency situations, communication, and I will touch briefly at the very end on PPE. We are probably not going to have time to cover all aspects of COVID-19 controls today, but hopefully we'll have allowed uh, time for questions at the end. So a lot has happened in the last few months, right back in, from in February, when many of us first heard of COVID-19. Since then, we have seen cases rise dramatically with the first death in the UK recorded at the beginning of March. Many events canceled and many shops, pubs, restaurants, and schools closed. Many of us working in the food and drink industry were classed back in March as key workers. And unlike many businesses which closed, many food manufacturing sites have remained open through the crisis. Over the last few months, the government and Public Health England have published loads of information, much of it directed at employers. Back on the 25th of February, they published one of the first guidance documents which gave quite basic information to employers through to the more recent and detailed sector guidance on the 11th of May, which gave more detailed steps for employers to take to prevent transmission of COVID-19 and included some photos. The three other administrations in Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland have produced their own guide, quite similar guidance. And this has been supplemented by documentation published by other bodies, including the BRC, Food Standard Agency and the Freight Transport Association, which all offer advice on COVID controls. And we'll try and signpost you to some of the best examples of these, which we have read at the end. So although new legislation was enacted back on the 25th of March in the form of the Coronavirus Act 2020 and the health protection regulations in the four administrations, this legislation related to the requirement to close premises and businesses and restrictions on movements and gatherings rather than to workplace health and safety. So the Health and Safety at Work Act remains the primary UK act in respect of any civil or criminal law brought for COVID-19. So where in the latest guidance it makes reference to the requirement for risk assessment in relation to COVID-19, the duty to assess and manage the risks of COVID-19 is a requirement of the management of health and safety at work regulation. Therefore, the principles of reducing the risk as low as is reasonably practicable and applying the hierarchy of control is the same. And actually the hierarchy of control can be easily applied to COVID-19 controls. And although much has been talked about PPE, it remains at the bottom of the hierarchy as the last resort. So we're going to talk about all parts of the hierarchy today, from eliminating 
isolating those with symptoms and shielding at risk individuals through substitution, such as uh, social distancing and remote working. We'll talk about engineering controls, screens between workstations, administrative controls such as hand washing, and communication such as posters and signage, and finally about PPE. So I am now going to hand over to David. Thanks, Pamela. Hopefully everyone can hear me okay. Um, good morning to everyone. Um, just sort of leading on from what Pamela said, it's a particularly challenging time from all points of view, but from a safety and health professional point of view, um, and I am one of them, it's been, uh, it's been very challenging to work out the best ways of working. But the, the thing that I've learned through this process is that you know, the, all the things that I've learned over the years and the principles that we've used over the years apply, apply to this scenario. Um, and uh, the hierarchy of control is, is, is important to keep in mind. The other thing is, is, to, is to really be science-led in the approach that we're, we're all taking. And uh, obviously the science is developing all of the time. So we're learning as we go. So every day is a challenge. We have a daily uh, call uh, with our CEO um, in our company and every day there's something a little bit different to tackle. So trying to go through these layers of control is, is uh, important. And the very first place to start is how can you eliminate um, this uh, uh, problem from your, from your operations. So the site boundary is key. Uh, the first question that everyone's asking is who is essential? Um, uh, there's a whole load of layers to this. Uh, the essential side of things can apply to, is there somebody needed on site to do uh, statutory inspections, for example? Throughout, the process, throughout this time, uh, I think uh, I've seen some really good responses from uh, contract companies, from our employees, making sure that uh, the, the, the key safety checks continue to go on. Um, and, and that's been I impressive to see really and, and, and to do them safely. Um, there are other layers around this, of course, about around, you know, what's essential to keep food on people's tables. I mean, I think the food industry particularly has recognized very early on that it had a key role to play. And there's all sorts of other people involved in, you know, keeping the country running. Um, but who do you need on site really to make sure that food continues to go out to people that need it? Um, so, so there's some things around that, but, but really to be challenging around, uh, you know, who really, really needs to be there and who can work away uh, from site. So alternative work methods, we're doing this on Zoom. This isn't something I expected necessarily to be doing <laughs> a few months ago, um, but we've all got used to these different platforms for, for working um, and things like um, uh, some companies are using cameras for doing remote assessments for things like ISO uh, assessments, for example. Um, there's quite a lot of technology being uh, in, in employed here to make sure that really we can keep people away from the sites because you're really trying to protect the workforce and your operations. All of those, all every, every decision you make needs to be uh, based around oh, really questioning whether people need to be there. One key area that seems to work a lot, and I'll come to it a little bit in contractors, uh, in the con context of contractors in a second, is this thing around separating out groups. You're trying to separate out individuals, of course, and we'll come to the two meter side of things. Um, but how can you separate into groups? So things like, uh, you know, where are the concentration points for your workforce? Is it the locker areas? That seems to be an area where everybody congregates, everybody tries to get into lockers. And um, we'll come to a few common areas, but thinking about how you, how you uh, segregate out, staggering the shifts, how can you get people to come in at different times? Some companies have done things like uh, for, for offices, put red and blue shift basically. So red desks are labeled and blue desks are labeled and the, the two don't meet basically. Um, uh, the red shift comes on and uses the red desks and the blue shift comes on and uses the blue desk. So splitting out and separation is absolutely critical, not just from the point of view of individuals, but actually from the point of view of groups of people. Um, and then special cases, just put special cases in, there's quite a few things around vulnerable individuals, I suppose, but particularly um, businesses like ours have had to deal with things like, you know, what about the mental health aspects of being uh, away from the workplace? And there's been a couple of cases where we've had some, uh, some discussions with people where they're really, really struggling to be separated out and we've uh, got them back onto sites in a safe way into 
uh, safe areas just to protect them from a mental health point of view so they're able to have some conversations with uh, uh, co-workers but because they've got some issues at home so it's worth thinking about special cases dealing with those on a on a case-by-case -case basis um minimizing the number of unnecessary visits to site uh, right from the beginning I'm, I'm sure lots of sites have done this even though some of them have continued to operate it's just who who do we stop from coming in and visitors have gone pretty much down to zero on most sites um, from what I what I've seen and from the experiences that we've talked through with other businesses there are some people coming on site keeping lists of them has become increasingly important as we go into sort of test and trace um, but even before the government's position, numbers of companies were looking at, you know, if we do have a case of COVID on site, how do we know uh, who else may have been impacted and who do we contact? So keeping lists of visitors is in the guidance from the government, but for, for, for very good reason. So keeping lists is good. And then finally on this slide, just the delivery side of things. Um, that's a contact point. Many of us are getting packages delivered to our houses um, and, and they've got a system for doing that. They're keeping away from us. They're taking pictures rather than getting you to sign. Same principles need to be employed from delivery's point of view. And there's a couple of pictures from different sites there around you know, having a demarcated area for packages to be delivered. Um, there's obviously the principle of not, the driver's actually not getting out of their cab if possible um, or keeping to a particular area area and the, the the sort of green container was an example of a, a site that had uh, deliveries to out to an outside area so how do you make sure the packages don't, don't get damaged well there's a place that you can put them a quite a simple solution but a good one because it means that there, there isn't the need for the delivery person to come onto site uh, next slide please Pamela just on the uh, protecting uh, on the uh, the at the site edge at the door um, you're trying to sort of minimize the amount of contact of course coming in so we've a number of companies have done pre-arrival information for people i think that's been working very well right at the beginning people were being told about the symptoms because it was very much an education process i think pretty much everyone knows what the symptoms are now and um, they've added an extra symptom as we've gone through the, the last few months but people are much clearer particularly at the beginning it was important to get that information out but still is you know you can't come on sites if you have any of the symptoms so doing that before actually someone sets off is a really good idea um, also uh, pre-visit induction you know things have changed on sites since probably some people last came on um, uh, uh, and and actually there's an element of anxiety there's an element of understanding what really needs to be done when you come on the site so people have created some booklets little videos there's quite a lot of examples of things where people are just giving some quick information to people before they arrive visitors contractors but also returning employees uh, temperature checking I got a question mark against only because um, temperature checking is only part of the uh, different levels of control that you might need uh, on on site um, the bottom left picture shows uh, you know a, a handheld temperature sc uh, screening device and to do that safely they've put in place a, a perspex screen the top photographs are from um, uh, for some from the sites that uh, I uh, work with and that's uh, sort of a, a very much uh, a number of companies using these sort of thermal scanners that are very quick they cost a bit of money to put in um, but you basically pass by them and then they'll alarm if you're over temperature um, we have a system where people go through if they're over temperature, which is very, very uh, 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 uncommon, um, they go to a cool down area for a few minutes, 10 minutes, because sometimes people are a bit hot as they come on site for whatever reason. They go through the process again. If they get triggered twice, then they're not allowed on site. Um, and uh, and that's worked very well from a, from a practical point of view. Obviously, if someone's got a fever, it, it, it will pick them up. But secondly, um, just from the point of view of uh, employee engagement and comfort as much as anything, but absolutely recognizing that you can have COVID without having a fever. So, so it's only part of the controls. Uh, just on the um, security um, reception staff side of things, you know, again, keeping people apart. These are common things we're starting to see in places like shops and supermarkets, but the screens, no handling of pens. Is there a way of putting in a, 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 a a tablet or something for for uh, registering visitors and then being able to wipe that clean and it is an opportunity to put clear signage up because that's the point where people are entering your site um, and that's the place where your first contact is so clear signage is important uh, next slide please on contractors um, the um, 
what I want to just cover here is these five steps to COVID secure. I'm sure most of you have seen this. I know it varies. We've probably got a lot of people on this call who are not necessarily tracking the uh, the the English uh, 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 guidance. There's, there's slightly different guidances where where a review go, but the approach of these five steps to COVID secure uh, apply to all aspects of running an operation safely. Putting the lens of contractors onto them, I thought was quite a good idea just to sort of show you a little bit about how you might need to think a bit differently with con contractors um, to, to protect them and to protect your own operations. So, you know, there's a need to do a risk assessment, of course. Um, but when we comes to uh, contract and project jobs, there's a need to do a method statement and risk assessment across the whole of a project, uh, which looks, uh, you focuses with the lens of COVID. Uh, 19 and then there will be specific jobs that the contractors do or contract companies do they'll also need to have uh, COVID requirements within their uh, risk assessments and there's a lot of cooperation and coordination required to make sure that the the, the sites controls and the contractors controls uh, work together and I think it's a real what, what I've seen again is great cooperation between contractors and sites to make sure that jobs are done safely from the point of view of cleaning and hygiene without going into too much detail, uh, you know, washing of things like tools, making sure that there's regular hand wash opportunities and sanitizers on sites is, is, is something to look for. And also the use of vehicles. So shared use of vehicles, we've put um, cleaning packs into forklift trucks, for example, but there are lots of trucks involved in uh, construction sites, etc. cetera. Um, those sort of um, behaviors and procedures are not something that people have been used to. I guess they're becoming increasingly used to the cleaning of these things but uh, having separate toolkits for individuals or groups of people and cleaning of tools is, is, is a new way of working and needs to be part of the risk assessment. Again who needs to be on site I think I've really covered that but the, you know who really is essential who, who really needs to be on site to continue to do things safely to make sure the plant is safe to make sure that we can continue to put food out of the door and continue with, with business in a safe way. And then the two final ones I particularly focus on, there are lots of ways to keep two meter social distancing in place. Um, now that might be between individuals, um, but that also might need to consider uh, groups of individuals. So sort of the, the, the groups that we I talked about a little bit earlier. Um, we had an example on one of our sites where we had two people who were having to put some doors in and they really had to be close, closer than two meters. And they put, we put, did a specific risk assessment and they had specific controls in place. But one of them did develop symptoms of COVID during the day. They were immediately locked down and, and isolated from site. But because that group of two was separate from everybody else, we didn't have a concern about it spreading through the rest of the workforce. So the work we've done to sort of separate out into groups really, really made a difference. And incidentally, that person was tested not as having COVID. So, you know, all good, all good for, from their, their point of view. Um, traveling, just a quick mention, traveling is a particular um, challenge particularly on contractors who sometimes would appear in vans full, vans full of people, we're having to separate those out as much as we can. That's a question that you do, you ask up front before you start running the projects or, or engaging with contractors. Who are they traveling in with? How can they separate out their transport as much as possible? And a quick call out, the Construction Leadership Council have been great. I think they've really done some great work to put some proper practical guidance in place. Version four is available on their website. It, it aligns with the government guidance as it happens, of course, now, but they were very quick to get some good guidance out to construction um, sector, and that's useful from the point of view of projects. Uh, next slide, please. So quickly go through these, uh, moving around just around the site. There's some good, great examples out there actually in, um, in, in uh, food and drink. Um, and there's the element of how do people get to work. So you've probably all seen encouraging people to cycle or walk to work. I, that's easier for some than others. If you've got, uh, uh, you're closer, closer in and it avoids the use of public transport, of course, that's, that's good, but it's not always practical to do, but it's good to encourage. Um, arriving on site, uh, there's a picture there of uh, some very clear messaging as people go through a turnstile, making sure that two meters distancing uh, is in place, but also at um, clocking in stations, so sanitizers at the entrance, staggering start time so you don't get everybody crowding in through turnstiles and clocking stations all in one go. And, um, and thinking about how you do that outside and, and inside the building is important. And the other area was around foot operation. 
uh, of, of quite a few things actually doors that we probably have seen but people have put some brackets on some doors so that you can pull the door open with your foot it's not always easy to do uh, particularly with doors that are difficult to open in the first place but it is a, it is a good solution for some for some doors um, and things like sanitizers the picture there is a is a foot operated uh, sanitizer and bins foot operated often in food and drink uh, industry they're foot operated anyway but we found quite a few sort of outside of the manufacturing areas where they weren't so we've replaced with them um, with, with foot operated uh, next slide and uh, going around the site corridors uh, sometimes difficult to uh, to manage particularly if you've got uh, some limitation on on space one-way systems are good if you can do it marking out the two meter spacing is good uh, sometimes it's impossible to do uh, to, to do to do either of those properly and and there are scenarios where um, we've seen sort of na narrower spaces where people just have to pass uh, one side or the other so almost like a divided like a road down the middle so the, there's a two-way flow and no one stops you basically keep you keep moving and, and keep the number of people through those locations to a minimum uh, number, doors themselves door guards are available for uh, keeping the door open if the fire alarm goes off it releases the the door and um, I think they're doing a pretty good trade actually because lots of people are putting those in because obviously you don't want people particularly in those sort of common areas and corridors people touching the same door handles over and over again and um, there are self sanitizing door handles available I, for, for high traffic routes I've not personally seen those uh, working but I know that companies that have put those in and then this little device which is the orange uh, device there we found those pretty useful they're not particularly good perhaps for food manufacturing itself because they become a foreign uh, object in the uh, in the manufacturing but actually in places like logistics and in offices they're very useful for uh, opening doors actually you can operate printers and things with them as well our printers at work uh, allow us to use those just to touch the panels without actually um, touching the um, uh, the the uh, controls uh, next slide please just the last thing common areas uh, the um, common areas uh, things like smoking shelters I think probably we're all working through how that might look as we go into sort of colder weather maybe later in the year but during these the weather that we've had it's been possible to extend quite a lot of these areas uh, quite easily um, obviously these are areas where people congregate and obviously normally would, would have a chat and probably uh, be a bit closer so clear messaging um, extending the space um, and then perhaps uh, limiting the numbers in some way around you know how when can you go for for smoking breaks is, is, is something really to look out for and I'll come to some, some sort of overall comment on that in a second um, next slide please Canteens again, um, an area where normally people would 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 want to congregate together. Um, so uh, I've seen lots of examples. I think we all have of extended overspill areas being created, whether it be port cabins. You can see at the bottom right there a picture of a sort of extensive area for allowing people to to sit well, well away from each other, taking out of chairs, screens, uh, um, all, all these things around thinning thinning those areas out so that people can observe. Uh, social distancing in 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 a, in a place where normally they will probably congregate in 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 uh, in close proximity. Next slide, please. Toilets again. I think if we if we redesign, we probably redesign toilets, wouldn't we? Going now, now if we had a chance, but we've got what we've got, and and so there's a lot of work being done uh, to show distance markers on the floor, uh, restrict access to certain bays, areas, sinks. Um, all of those things need. Uh, thinking through I've also seen we've also seen examples of, of uh, sort of the one one in one out even if there's multiple toilets inside the room it's just one person in and then there's a sign on the door or a way of locking the door from the inside to prevent anyone else from going in next slide please some final slide is just to say you know common areas if there's one area one one, one thing to really look out for it, it's these because because actually on the work on the lines in your normal manufacturing areas or wherever you are those those places tend to be a little bit easier for people to sort of follow a set set of rules but when it comes to these common areas 
these are the places where uh, the biz businesses have found it more difficult to uh, help people keep apart. So regular checks in these areas is important. Just make sure that the behaviors and people are doing the right thing. You can understand why uh, people will want to bunch together when in a canteen. So uh, these, are, these are areas of particular focus for all the businesses that we've been talking to. Just to keep a, a closer eye, remind people more, really clear signage um, and, and en enabling the space for people to keep uh, the social distancing. I'm going to now hand over to Alison uh, who's going to continue from this point onwards. Thanks David, uh, hopefully you can all hear me okay. Um, I'm going to talk about distancing around sort of uh, work environments and particularly within factories to start with. Um, obviously we all are well aware that uh, COVID controls can be implemented in, in various ways but wherever possible, people should be kept as far away as possible from others. But each business is going to be different. And, you know, we need to establish uh, positions where people do operate and where they could come into contact with others um, in, in, in order to ensure the two metre distance is achieved. So we should be doing task risk assessments uh, to, uh, to establish if in the course of our work, they do have to move away from their station and change position and that distance is lessened. Uh, where this is the case and obviously we need to ensure that additional control measures are put in place. Uh, this slide is an example of how one site has particularly tackled um, the uh, pr problem of distancing and what they've managed to do is actually elongate uh, their conveyors to actually allow for spacing. Now that's not possible in all workplaces um, but obviously here they have the, have the space available to do it. Um, but it's important to remember that still where you know we have got workers working face to face should be avoided and you know back to back or side to side working is far preferable um, than the face to face working. Next slide please Pamela. Uh, some other options I think as David's touched on uh, to consider are assigning staff to, into the groups uh, so they only ever work uh, on the same lines or with the same group of people. And even though the social distancing, obviously, then they are only working and going out to breaks together. Revisit your shift planning to ensure that, as I say, there's no um, joined up uh, shifts coming together and people aren't on site at the same time. Some sites have even slowed down production lines to enable less people to be on lines so, so they can enhance the social distancing. Another option uh, that particularly my sites have considered where they've had numerous rows of production lines is to run alternative lines so you, the distance is achieved by not running a line. Um, again, you know, that does have impacts on uh, efficiencies and labour, but obviously it's something that to ensure that social distancing can be achieved. And remember, always consider your agency workers. Obviously, food industry has, you know, historically a lot of agency workers within it. But be mindful of those people and if they are coming into sight that they are allocated to a certain area and to a certain bubble of people uh, and try and avoid moving them between different departments or different sites wherever possible. Um, where uh, social distancing can't be achieved, some sites are putting screens between individuals, uh, which range from fixed ones on lines, hanging ones, movable ones, there's various different options. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more in the next slide. Next slide please Pamela. So again, this, this, you know, there's various options shown on this side, there's many designs as you can see, and you know, there is no one size fits all. You have to look at what, is a, you know, what the layout of your uh, plant is and what actually fits with what you need. Um, when designing and uh, selecting the screens, you, know, you must consider all work positions. Um, my sites particularly have a lot of different changes of products and you know, people's positions have to change down the line as a result of that. So obviously the screens for that purpose need to be flexible and need to be able to light, be lightweight and be able to move to create the distancing depending on what the product is made. As you can see from the picture in the middle, you know, some of the uh, sites started off quite crudely and to create screens with just, you know, a very simple plastic sheeting. Obviously as time's gone on, these have evolved and there's some quite sophisticated um, uh, and creative and practical solutions that have been put into place. Next slide please Pamela. So, you know, the food industry has many, many people that they need to get in and out of sites. And I know David's touched on toilets, but obviously hand washing is a key control and the strict hygiene requirements around that are really important that, you know, we get right. But obviously, you know, at the point at which people enter the factory, you know, they, people need to hand wash. And so obviously we need to make sure that correct segregation is done. 
uh, obviously it's really important to remember if you do take sinks out of use so whatever that you include them on your legionella uh, regimes for flushing and uh, you know your legionella controls um, but as I said, it's important people, are f the flow of people is controlled through these areas so that there's no bottlenecks. Some sites have implemented marshals to ensure that it's only one person in one person out. Others stagger release from lines uh, so people are allowed to pass through safely and at the right social distance. Also, what we need to, we've had to consider is moving and uh, changing areas because they can be a particular pinch point. Um, particularly at break times. So a lot of sites that I'm aware of have actually uh, split locker rooms. So they've uh, moved uh, lockers into offices or into other areas to actually split the number of people that are having to go to lockers at one time so people are, avoid um, uh, coming together. One of the sites, it was identified that work overalls were a particular problem. Previously, they'd all be hung up together. So when people went to breaks, they'd hang them on their pegs. But obviously, this potentially could have caused a problem with people selecting the wrong overall that somebody else had worn. So initially, it started off where bags were used. So at the start of shift, people got given a bag with their name label on and their clock number that they could put their PPE in at break time. This then evolved to, for the individual lockers to be put in the, in the picture at the bottom. Um, so, you know, not only did that create some more space, they could actually take out some of the um, uh, hanging space to allow more space around the sinks, but actually it was a really good reassurance um, uh, thing for the staff on that site. Next slide please, Pamela. So, next area I want to discuss is office environments. Um, Wherever possible, you know, we should allow people to work from home. Obviously, that's not always practical if people are having to put um, ingredients into pots. But there are a lot of people, such as planners and finance people, that do not need to be on site so they can work from home. That should be actively encouraged. Um, but the same principles apply. If, you, if people can't work from home, then they should be put into bubbles or work alternative shifts. I know a lot of sites that I've come across have put people on to rotating shifts so that the two groups never come apart, uh, come together. And so they're not mixing with large numbers of other people. There's some helpful guidance available on the internet for home workers, such as risk assessments, so people can assess their um, you know, home areas. And obviously it's, it's fairly standard for what people would have been doing previously for DSE assessments, but obviously the same uh, principles apply. Office layouts historically have had desks located close together uh, to make the best use of space. But if obviously they can't be moved apart, then you need to consider isolating some desks to create space between different people. Signage and floor markings can be of benefit, um, but also signage on particular desks can um, act as a reminder to, for people to distance. Where desks are located in areas of high traffic or where desks um, are located where people are face to face, then um, screens um, may be an option and should be considered. Again, there are many, many different types um, available from cardboard temporary screens, pull up banner type screens um, or, um, you know, fixed perspex screens. The screen um, that's highlighted uh, at the top is one that's been designed by uh, one of the sites. Um, because obviously they wanted to take into consideration slips and trips. So this screen has actually got two different feet on, one that actually fits underneath the desk or next to adjacent to a desk and the one that actually sticks out has no foot on so there's no trip risk as such. Um, so you know there's some really um, creative and sensible ideas that are, that are out there. Um, so you know and whatever we introduce we should ensure that we're not introducing any other hazards. Next slide please Pamela. So um, meetings are another area, particularly where uh, everyone is having to get used to a completely different way of working and businesses will have to consider. Um, where possible, as David's touched on, a virtual meeting should be utilised. If not, meeting rooms should be allocated a safe occupancy level, as should all uh, offices. So there's some examples of signage there uh, shown on the screen. Um, clean desk policy should be introduced. Uh, so that anyone that uses a desk or meeting room sanitises it before and after use. And consider locating sanitising units at office entrances, uh, by clocking machines or wherever people uh, come into areas. Um, there's one shown at the bottom, I know we've touched on foot operated, but these are actually automatic ones so people don't actually have to touch any surface, they just put their hands under and it squirts the sanitiser onto them. Um, 
But what's important, as David also touched on, was you know where people are working from home, they do need regular updates, regular contact, so that any changes that occur, if they do have to come onto site for any reason, they are aware of um, and, and fully briefed before they actually come back to site. Now I'm just going to move on to talk about logistics. Uh, so next slide, please, Pamela. Um, within this logistics and supply chain, you will have persons coming onto your site that you are aware, unaware of their COVID status. Due diligence at security uh, regarding health status or screening is something that Dave spoke about earlier, but it's an absolutely important and key first step. Historically, drivers bring with them delivery notes, but in order to minimise any transfer between people, you know, look at electronic transfer of data or photographing of, of the document through screens, so touching is not required. It's important that any contact with drivers is limited and persons socially distanced at all times. So procedures need to be clear regarding contact with vehicles and wherever possible site persons should minimise all contact with external vehicles. It's important that you consider other areas where items are transferred. Some sites use key control to prevent vehicle driveways, but keys need to be transferred. Some sites have come across and come up with some novel ways, such as using litter grabbers um, to transfer keys into a sterile bag and, and vice versa on the way back. Other sites have changed their procedures to look at things such as wheel chocks so there's no actual transfer of items. There should be sanitizer stations available for drivers at the point of entry to the site and in any waiting areas and drivers must have access to welfare facilities but strict hygiene controls and cleaning is required in these areas. The document shown on the slide is a guidance document from FTA and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. This gives some really good detailed advice on good practice in logistics with pictorial examples. Uh, so I would recommend that you have a look at that if you are, are dealing with logistics. Moving on to sites and transportation, signage and cleaning or sanitising instructions should be understood and displayed on items such as pallet trucks, forklift trucks, and wherever possible, these should be allocated to individual operators uh, for each shift. Touch points should be regularly cleaned, for example, handles, steering wheels, keypads, etc. And the FTA have issued a guidance document specifically for cleaning of NHE, which is also just highlighted on the bottom of the screen, which gives further details specifically on methods of cleaning for those items of, of kit. And this leads me nicely onto the next slide, which is going to cover cleaning and hygiene. Thanks, Pamela. We're all aware of the key role that effective cleaning and hygiene has in reducing the spread of COVID. Enhanced cleaning is, critical, is a critical control in the fight against the trans transmission of the virus in the workplace. It's been well publicised that the COVID virus can remain on some surfaces for up to 72 hours. So when you start to review the cleaning processes, you will discover there are multiple objects that are touched regularly. From the obvious door handles, handrails, trolleys, tabletops and light switches. And you need to try and obviously minimise um, these wherever possible. But you can try and minimise touch points by keeping doors open, as we've said, using door openers, use of contactless payments in canteens. But remember, if we have got keypads and things, look at using stylus pens or whether people have individual stylus pens, because obviously that can uh, stop the uh, contact. Other items to consider, and sometimes are forgotten, are things such as telephones. Um, obviously in offices or some uh, work areas, there, there are shared telephones. So if that is the requirement, then consider speaker or voice operated phones to stop persons needing to place handsets near the face and try and avoid wherever possible sharing of, of office phones. I know a lot of sites have gone on to use of mobiles to, to specifically um, reduce that risk. As mentioned in the last section, must clean and sanitise all mobile uh, handling equipment or mobile work equipment before and after use. Um, you know, we are potentially introducing a lot of things into the business as, as part of COVID control, such as screens or uh, etc. Remember that they're also cleaning, included on cleaning schedules. Um, canteens and kitchens, you must consider vending machines, fridges and microwaves. If you can't make them contactless, then obviously you must introduce additional cleaning and sanitising regimes. Think about water fountains as well. Obviously, people placing their own cups and bottles uh, to the outlet nozzle is a transmission risk, so discourage this. You know, and obviously, from an environmental point of view, it's not ideal, but you know, a lot of sites have gone over to disposable alternatives because they don't want people uh, having that contact. Uh, some less obvious things to consider TV remotes in offices, barcode scanner guns. Again, if possible, allocate these scanner guns to individual operatives with a strict hygiene and sanitising protocol. Uh, but also gloves is an option to reduce the risk if they do have to be um, shared. And ensuring cleaning equipment is readily available in all areas include cleaning of shared items in pre-use checks, 
try and encourage people to clear all surfaces and objects from their desks or work areas to make it easier for cleaning and also this reduces the need for cleaning staff to handle and move objects. Um, so I'm now going to hand you back over to Pamela who's going to take you through a few more things. Thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, talk briefly about dealing with emergencies. Um, as with all foreseeable emergencies, we need to plan what action we should take if an employee or other person develops symptoms of COVID-19 when at work. So the very early guidance recommended that all workplaces should have an isolation room, so a room to take an unwell person to suffering from COVID symptoms to isolate them from their other colleagues. Um, Later guidance now says that if a person feels well enough, they should go straight home. But if you have a scenario where someone feels so unwell that you have to contact a family member or in extreme cases where you need to contact the emergency services, then the isolation room is important to keep that person away from other colleagues. It's definitely worth having a document procedure on what to do in this scenario, especially with regard to cleaning protocols thinking about having a designated person to walk in front of the person to open doors so the affected person doesn't have to touch them, providing a bin bag for them to put their overalls and PPE in. If they collect belongings from their locker, asking them to leave it open so it can be sanitized. And if they are using public transport, ensuring they have a mask. Um, and obviously you should ensure anyone that who needs to be in close contact with this person wears appropriate PPE including an FFP3 mask if available, or if not a surgical mask, a visor and an apron. You also need to think about the role of first aiders. Unfortunately, people don't stop having accidents just because of COVID. So first aiders, if required to treat someone um, following an accident, generally need to come within two meters and therefore will need to wear PPE. Again, FFP3 masks if available, uh, visors and apron. The Resuscitation Council actually updated their guidance with regard to giving CPR. So the guidance now is not to give rescue breaths and to place a cloth or towel over the victim's mouth and nose and attempt compression only CPR. It's worth, worth also thinking about other emergency evacuations where people would congregate in a group. Although COVID controls shouldn't delay exit from a building, some companies have thought how they can manage social distancing at muster points. For example, by painting spots at two meter distances on car parks uh, or using the T of marked out car parking spaces. Uh, it's also worth thinking how people return back to their workstations once the evacuation is over. For example, staggering the return by group. So I'm just moving on to behavioral change. So anyone who's ever implemented a behavioural change programme, they'll know that behavioural change is not easy and takes time. However, this pandemic has brought about behavioural change on an unprecedented scale almost overnight. We've asked our employees to change their behaviour from social distancing, washing and sanitising their hands and attending virtual meetings rather than face to face. As well as providing clear instruction about why a behaviour is important, it is also important to remove any barriers. Make sure you do everything you can to make it more likely that they will adopt that behaviour. And we've heard about some of these today, such as staggering shift times, one-way systems, maximising the availability of wash basins, providing social distance stickering. Using simple, clear messaging to explain guidelines, using images and clear language, with consideration of groups uh, for which English may not be their first language, is key to ensuring everyone understands why each, each behaviour is important. As with all things health and safety related, there is a need for strong and active leadership from the top of the business, from your board, your CEO or MD. The regular communication is key. The examples I've come across is weekly written communication, briefed out and put in notice boards, videos from CEOs or MDs, webinars or conference calls, and I've seen increasing use of Slido where people can ask anonymous questions, personal thank you letters to employees' home addresses, which is something we did. Um, and even text messages. And I think slowly senior leaders are returning to site um, to look at COVID controls. Most businesses have now various media they can use, um, such as from the old fashioned notice boards, posters, TV screens and internet. But I know a few companies that have set up WhatsApp groups with employees or dedicated phone numbers for 
um, COVID queries. And I also know many companies have surveyed their staff using SurveyMonkey, for example, to find out how they're feeling about the crisis. So it's important to think um, where to locate your communication. There's no point overwhelming people with information in one place. Um, worth having a think about dwell times. Where do people stay a bit longer and therefore can digest longer messages? And the classic one here is the back of uh, the back of toilet doors. Where do people pass through and therefore much more succinct messages are better? And corridors are a good example of that. And um, also ensuring that you consider opportunities for placement of material related to the most important behavior in that area. So displaying signs about symptoms at entrances and clocking in stations, hand washing in toilets, social distancing in areas where people congregate. And all these changes might come as a shock to someone who hasn't been in the workplace for a while. For example, those returning to work after furlough um, or um, isolation. So developing an induction pack or awareness booklet is a good idea. So as I said at the beginning, the final thing I wanted to cover was PPE. So I'm going to talk about PPE rather than face coverings. Um, the government has been very clear from the start of the crisis that it sees the benefit of additional PPE outside of healthcare limited. And we know this is clearly because they don't want the much needed PPE in the healthcare sector to be diverted elsewhere. They also believe the risk should be managed through social distancing and hygiene rather than through use of PPE. However, they've acknowledged that based on risk assessment, in some instances, PPE, particularly masks, visors and gloves, will have a role to play in reducing the transmission um, of COVID-19 in the workplace. Um, so I know sites where everyone is wearing protective visors, some other sites where uh, they've identified specific roles where social distancing can uh, competently uh, be achieved. Um, additional PPE is one for engineering tasks, which require two persons, and gloves and mass advisors will be given, given to drivers who are consumer facing where the risk is uh, potentially higher. I think with all PPE, if issued, you need to make it sure you uh, provide clear instruction on how to put off, take off, and importantly, dispose of. So today we've covered most of the tiers of the hierarchy of control and given you some practical examples from across the food and drink industry. We hope this has gone some way to assist in helping you to um, make your business become COVID um, secure. Displaying the COVID secure poster indicates that you believe that you fully comply with the government's guidance on managing the risk of COVID-19 and confirms that you've taken the five steps towards compliance. I mentioned right at the beginning that we would sign you, post you to some useful documents. Obviously the most important uh, document is the sector guidance. Um, it's also worth looking at the guidance published by the other three administrations um, and also our enforcement bodies. I know that uh, the HSE in Northern Ireland have published a generic COVID um, risk assessment and numerous other bodies have published guidance, some of which we've already mentioned today and some more which you um, can see listed on the screen. Okay, so uh, great news. We've got loads of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Bad news, we're not gonna be able to answer them all in the time allocated. I think we'll, we'll, all have, we'll all have opinions on these, some really good questions, some very sort of philosophical ones. There's some direct, direct straight to the point questions which we can, we can try and deal with and we'll also post uh, answers for the ones that we uh, didn't get through. There was a comment actually, which was just pick up from uh, Kieran. It says about in Ireland, the construct construction in industry federation have put similar guidance out on construction. So it just shows you there's some good guidance coming in uh, across uh, different parts of the uh, the UK and Ireland. So keep, we've got some of that stuff listed. Um, I'll go for the uh, a question around. Uh, auditing, uh, Alison, I think, uh, if I point this one to you, because I think you've had some experience, but I can comment. And um, the question is, I'm concerned because I am an auditor and need to visit sites. I think my role is important to check standards and systems are in place. What do you think? 
Yeah, I mean, obviously it has to be risk assessed as to the the distance that you're going to be in contact. And if the, you do need to talk to people, obviously that has to be socially distanced or additional protection measures. A lot of audits have gone online, um, that, as, you, as you touched on, but where it is essential that auditors have to go to site, then obviously it's really important that they are protected uh, and you are protecting your own people as well. So it's... Um, Can I mention, David? Mm -hmm. So... Um, so we're doing internal audits, so our health and safety team are doing internal audits, but with, um, so they're visiting sites, but with fit controls in place so that you're only able to uh, attend a site every seven days. So um, having that sort of interval between um, visits, we're also thinking about whether or not we ask our customers if when they start to come back on for audits, whether we can ask them to adopt similar controls. Great. Uh, there's all sorts we can say about all of these questions. I, I, so I'll move on to the next one, but we're happy to engage later on with, with more. Um, Mike, Mike, give us a, a, a bit of a, a tricky one for us, but do you think it's important to think long-term, but only make short-term decisions, i.e. don't make long-term verbal projections or definitive long-term statements? If I just quickly answer that, I think uh, this thing is changing all the time. Even while we were preparing this presentation, things were changing. So to be able to project for Forward is, is incredibly difficult. If we if we had a if we had a, an enemy an enemy or a hazard out there that we really fully understood, it'd be much much easier. There's a couple of questions further down the line around um, what do you think our reaction will be to the two meter rule changing to one meter? And I'll just answer from my point of view, and the others might want to comment. Um, the two meter rule is there from a safety point of view, and and, and if you reduce that distance, uh, obviously the risk increases. So our position is at this stage that we will stick with two meter distancing rule and the standard that we've got. Of course, if the science becomes very clear that that's not so much of an issue, then we'll reevaluate. But the, what we don't want to do is start cramming people into our operations when we actually feel that we're running things in a, in a safe, safe way now and, and people have got used to those controls. But that is something we're going to have to watch because the, the perception from outside will be that, you know, one meter is OK now, isn't it? You can come a bit closer. So, so I think um, that's an answer from me on that. Is there any other views from the others? You guys no, on I think that? We've, come to the, we've come to the same conclusion that we will stick with the two meters uh, until... Um, such time as that, that is, the science backs that up more. Yeah, okay. similar to us, we discussed this yesterday and we, we decided we would probably stick with the two metres, even if the guidance changes. Great. Uh, good. There's a few questions about the temperature scanning. I realise that that's uh, not the answer to everything. Um, uh, a couple of things around, you know, uh, what about a cool, cool down room? Where do you put the cool down room? How long are people required to be in the room? Our experience has been that, uh, you know, a, a cool down room for 10 minutes is has been fine. Obviously not in uh, sitting in a, a, a greenhouse or in direct sunlight helps because, of course, one of the reasons that people trigger the um, control the scanner is because they're overheated in the first place. So just somewhere that's a bit a bit like normal room temperature, a bit cooler, allowing them to 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 uh, cool down. We had someone who came onto the site who'd cycled onto site. So you know we're encouraging cycling, but they're over they're they're hot when they arrive. So ten minutes has given them time to to reduce down. Um, and just to say on the scanning, there were a couple of other questions around: is handheld better than um, the thermal? Uh, cameras i would say there's a huge amount of equipment out there and a lot of people trying to sell it so it's worth having a good look through what people have got out there the handheld ones are vary in their accuracy you do have to have someone controlling them and you have to have someone sort of in the space of other people to, to take the measurements so there is that issue the uh, the, the other uh, installed equipment is much more expensive but it's very rapid and can process people if, uh, if that's the right word very very rapidly and it's uh, a, a, cal a calibratable and there's lots of advantages to them but they cost they cost money to use they are not the answer because as somebody else points out in the questions people can be asymptomatic so we we know, we know that's only part of the controls uh, on, on sites and there's obviously a lot of debate about whether that sort of scanning is effective for catching flights and that sort of thing but it, it's purely part of the controls. Anybody want to add on to that? Is that okay from an answer? That's okay. 
Um, there's a question on, I think we sort of answered this, Pam, um, a little bit, but this thing around face visors versus face coverings in the food industry, um, what's the usefulness or otherwise of face visors rather than face coverings? Do you want to add anything else on that? Uh, well, I, I think, I'm not sure about the scientific evidence of it. Sorry, there's an alarm going off in my background. <laughs> Um, but I think um, face visors are easier, I think, to use in that they can be disinfected, um, they can be cleaned easier. Um, I think they prevent people from touching their face as much. They're probably easier to breathe in. They're probably easier to communicate in. Um, they, uh, you know, I think you can see people's um, facial expressions. So I think there's some advantages to um, face visors over masks. Yeah. Certainly, that's way, the way we've gone as well. There's all sorts you can say about that, but uh, I mean, there was some. There was a study. I think it was done by Edinburgh University around. You know, if you do happen to uh, sneeze or whatever, when in a visor, the down there's a downdraft on a visor with a face covering. It goes off in lots of different directions. The science is is something to keep track of. But lots of visors have appeared in food manufacturing environments for the reasons that Pamela's ex explained. And but it's again, it's not an excuse to go within uh, right up to someone. You know, we're trying to, to use all the layers to protect. people. People. Um, we haven't got many much time left. There's quite a lot of questions, and we'll say we'll, we'll, we'll go for them. Um, somebody mentioned about the cleanliness and effectiveness, of, effective cleanliness and effectiveness of protective screens. An example where they'd been into a, a police headquarters, as it happens, uh, and, and they, were, they were dirty. I think that was covered in one of our presentations. That actually keeping them clean is absolutely critical because they become part of the uh, the controls in a food manufacturing environment. I suppose it's a bit different because everything has to be clean anyway. So we we do have slightly different controls in food manufacturing but as you start to see these screens appear elsewhere cleaning of them of course will be will be important um, and I'm sure most businesses that are customer facing will not want to have dirty screens as you go into their shops etc. Um, what records are you keeping names of contractors and personnel for COVID-19 in relation to test and trace and how will this work with GDP? Um, I can answer uh, very briefly I would say we were, we're keeping the same details as we've always kept, probably being as rigorous as we have been in the past. Names of contractors who have been on site, visitors, our employee records are the same as they were. The test and trace is a whole, I could talk for ages about test and trace. There's a whole load of things that we've, we, we need to think about with test and trace. But the important thing is, of course, is that you, you are protecting people when they're on your site. And so when it comes to a case of a COVID, uh, a, per a person being tested positive for COVID, you, you feel confident that actually it, it, wasn't, it wasn't transmitted on the site because you've got all these controls in place. Now, that doesn't mean to say that there's not going to be a need to not lock some people down. Um, and we will keep records. We're keeping records to make sure that we can at least respond uh, properly to uh, the government's request to, 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 to identify people that might be affected. Um, so it's a good question and I think we, we, we've got a responsibility as uh, businesses to make sure that we help the test and trace process in a sensible way. Shall I go for one more Alison? Two minutes? Go on then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Alice, I'll give this one to you quick. Uh, the, the guidance, what guidance exists for safe staff training or refresher training? Uh, Department for Education has no guidance about the use of rooms for, for, go, for vocational training. So will e-learning for all staff become the norm? I think a lot of, initially a lot of sites are working through this currently where things can go um, e-learning. Obviously it's um, a lot more difficult in, you know, using some of the uh, online platforms to get, ensure the messages landed correctly. I know a lot of sites are doing COVID training via this sort of forum. But yeah, I think it's something that a lot of businesses are going to have to work through because I know, you know, I run Irish Managing Safety, I normally have 20 people in a room that is not going to be able to happen going forward in the in the you know in the new norm so obviously we you know we're going to have to rethink that and all and i think a lot of sites are just working through that currently um but yeah online training is is part of it but i don't think that's the the be all and end all for some of the sites type of training that we have to do so great thanks Alison. now the time is our time's up so i will draw a line here and cover for pam uh who obviously isn't having to finish up i'd just like to say thanks to everyone for joining the uh th this webinar 
um, hopefully we, we felt it was important to try and sort of share as much as we could because we were learning from lots of different businesses and this isn't just uh, you know stuff that's come from our our companies it's lots of different companies and so thanks to everyone that's contributed we will answer the questions we'll try our best to uh, help uh, you it's a really tricky situation for all of us to make some of the right judgments and to give the right advice so hopefully we've given you at least some ideas of what you can do um, to uh, to to make people keep people safe and, and ultimately that's what it's about isn't it that two meter one meter thing is an interesting thing it's about keeping our people safe and that's what we want to continue to do and we're going to learn more as we go through this so thanks to uh, Alison and Pamela as well uh, and uh, I hope we hope it was useful and we hope it makes things safer in businesses as we go forward so thank you very much <laughs>